Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Red Hat Summit. And um, we're going to get started. There's people that are going to be migrating in. I uh, just want to introduce us, get through the names and stuff. Um, my name is John Schockschober. My nickname is Shaq. And yeah, most people are disappointed to, when they meet me, but uh, because I'm not a very large basketball player. Um, a colleague that's going to join me, we're going to step you through performance engineering and performance tools, uh, et cetera, on both uh, kernel, uh, some around the virtual memory, uh, network and disk. And, um, and so rather than just hear me or Larry, uh, who have done it in the past, we have some of our other principal engineers joining us. So uh, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. You should be on. Uh, uh, kernel engineers at Red Hat. I work on virtual memory and uh, the kernel itself. Hey, y'all. My name is Jeremy Eater. I work for Shack on uh, do little latency networking containers now, as you can see my shirt, and what I call weird, weird kernel stuff. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm Bill Gray. I work for Shack also. I focus on CPU and memory issues, uh, NUMA, and a little bit of HPC stuff as well. Right, so as people filter in, um, one challenge, a lot like the keynote being Red Hat, we decide to do multiple people in case we need to uh, high availability. I guess we have one too many engineers for, for uh, microphones, but we are going to probably break very briefly, not for everybody to leave the session, because we, we get paid per slide, so we have lots of slides. Um, you, you guys get all the slides. We may go fairly quick. and. Um, uh, and in lieu of that, we are, you know, definitely want to get feedback on performance. We want to help you with performance. And in fact, this year they've given us uh, birds of the feather this evening. Hope everyone can hear me. Yeah. And um, so if you want to, what we're going to do is save the questions till the, uh, till the end if we have time, because I doubt we will. Uh, but or we can invite you to uh, birds of the feather room 206. It's opposite the pavilion, but they did guarantee both food and beverages uh, at the BOF, so don't worry about missing out on that. We're, we actually got them uh, to, to deliver that into the conference room. So uh, again, before we get started, so Red Hat users out there, um, I've been Red Hat uh, like 10, 10 and a half years. Larry? Uh, 13 plus. Bill Gray and Jeremy? So we're looking at how many people are still running, or how many people are running Red Hat 5 in your environments. Just a quick show of him. Beautiful. And so Red Hat 6, do we have anyone? Ah, nice. And now for the top question, Red Hat 7. Very nice. OK. Yeah. Good so Red Hat 3. We do have a few. Um, and Red Hat 4, why not? Let's go through them all. I, sh I should say Red Hat Enterprise 7, because Red Hat 7 used to be a product in, in 1999. So I'm hoping you've migrated off of that. So we are going to show you briefly uh, some of the history. So this is the, the schedule. As I said, we may try to let people at least exit for bio break, if they need it, we may continue along. So I don't mind if people get up and leave or you know, come in halfway through. But we are going to cover this as the schedule. And so the, the top story is, for us, it's about watching and helping mature Linux and our customers get more value and performance. Uh, I call it out of the box. But in general, what we've been doing in the area of, of large pages we have uh, automatic tools now, transparent huge pages, our demons that run on 6 and 7. Uh, CPU affinity, there's ways to manually ma manipulate that. And in fact, Red Hat uh, 7 introduced uh, the ability to not just manipulate CPU in the scheduler, but also manipulate um, where CPU and memory gets scheduled. And so Larry and others are going to go through in depth. Uh, you can still do manual pinning. Red Hat 6 introduced C groups, control groups to sort of isolate, and we 
we essentially used to use those to control service level agreements. Jeremy's going to go into what containers and Docker and Atomic have done in Red Hat 7. And then uh, for device and interrupts, uh, the IRQ balance daemon runs. That's still an area that we're going, we're teaching IRQ balance more about non-uniform memory. And a lot of these have to be automatic as you then look on the very right hand side, uh, whether it's called Red Hat Cloud Suites or essentially our Rev, OpenStack platform, uh, Atomic, and Atomic platform was announced this morning, um, and OpenShift. Um, and I shouldn't forget Cloud Forms, but the, the first, all the Red Hat based products actually rely on a fair amount of automation so that when you run your cloud with Red Hat products, you can actually derive most of the performance uh, without heroic tuning. Now, it's always nice to do some tuning and get some performance gains. So let's get into the, uh, what the team does a little bit. Left-hand side, we run industry standard micro benchmarks. These are available to you. You can download them. We can help you with pointers. Um, things test uh, CPU, memory, disk, network, file systems. Uh, bare metal, virtualized with VMware, virtualized with KVM. Um, and I should have added the containers because the last two years we've been essentially trying to, to take all our applications and not just run them on bare metal, but also run them on container, in container environments. So the last three months it's been with atomic containers. Finally, the right-hand side is we take a lot of benchmarks and workloads. We're proud to help our OEMs and partners publish benchmarks. Uh, there's a laundry list of them here. They're still developing cloud benchmarks, so we invite you guys to participate if you are an OEM or a vendor, or if you're out there and just want to get involved in benchmarking. Uh, there's consortia, and it's important to create a level playing field. Uh, a quick example, uh, just recently when Intel Haswell EX announced their four socket uh, latest Haswell machines, a number of these workloads, uh, vendors get to choose which operating system they use to publish results. And so we're, we're delighted to see a good mix of world records coming out, uh, not just you know, on Linux and, on, and particularly Red Hat Linux. You'll see Red Hat 7 is starting to, to fill the billboard for a lot of results. Um, just a quick summary of, of the field, how many percent of benchmarks people are doing uh, with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. The left side are um, some spec CPU and spec vert. This isn't a marketing um, presentation, so I won't, I'll try not to do too many more of these, but you can see 67 to 80 percent of the vendors are, are using Red Hat Enterprise Linux. On the right side, uh, SAP two tier. Again, we, we hold the, the top, not just the top Linux results, the top world records in those areas. And so as we get into the bulk of this, there's really two dimensions of performance we're going to go through. Um, this is kind of an old wacky slide I pulled back up because it shows a difference between latency. Uh, so the highway example is your highway may be more narrow or certain width, but latency isn't really about the width. It's about how fast the speed limit is, or how fast can you actually get your packets per second from point A to point B, or your disk I.O. from A to B, or your memory access. And so things on the left-hand side are in, in the old days when every couple of years the gigahertz would go up another 25 30%. That's slowing. Um, but instead, you'll see memory speeds and core counts increase. Um, so the right-hand side, when you're doing throughput, that's the area where multi-core and very large multi-CPU NUMA machines essentially attack this bandwidth. Might have a lower speed limit. In the case of this example, we did find 85 as a speed limit for I-30 in, in Texas. And um, actually, 65 is 495. Um, in, uh, in Massachusetts, no one goes that speed anyway. But, um, I'll move along and say why are these important. So when you look at our tuned infrastructures, a lot of the guys on our team, Jeremy kind of helped 
formalized this, we used to use Ktune in Red Hat 6, in, uh, I'm sorry, in Red Hat 5. That's still there as a service. It's a binary turn it on and off, and we hope that it helps your throughput. Uh, Red Hat 7, 6 and 7 both essentially allow you to select profiles that try to match your user environments. And furthermore, we, we publish what's in the profile if you want to do more fine tuning. It's a way to basically set up a config that's persistent between reboots so that you don't miss the tuning. How many people have you know, gotten on a system, done some tuning, hey, I got 10%, go home, somebody reboots it, they forgot what they did, they weren't clear on the tuning, or a new rev of software comes in, right? So it's a way to kind of standardize uh, between boots. And you can, uh, we found that for our other products in Red Hat, we've started to use a hierarchical model. So here's an example, right? So on the left-hand side is our throughput. Um, actually, throughput performance is a, is a default in Red Hat 7, so you no longer have to switch off from what was used to be more of uh, the balanced is more for a workstation or a laptop, because Linux kind of has that uh, background. It's got a so it's solving their defaults are are from you know the smallest uh, machines all the way up to the largest data centers. Red Hat Enterprise Linux is more about um, you know throughput or latency, and then again you can select network profiles. Those were added recently in Red Hat Seven. Network throughput, network latency uh, for virtual environments, virtual host, virtual guest. Our Rev product actually sets up virtual host. O OpenStack will set up virtual host. When you install guest, you, you know, v VMware environments, a lot of fo folks gain performance by using virtual guest in that environment. And then finally, you can basically um, essentially build your own. And so here's an example of what's in these profiles. So we're managing sometimes the, the energy policy on how much power do you save versus how much performance do you get. We're managing things like read aheads and some of the scheduler tunables Larry's gonna go into. Uh, the dirty ratios, the VM dirty ratios are like flushing things to disk. So uh, some good tutorials on the settings we have today for the different profiles. Uh, and then, so we're gonna go into why set those tunables. And, and I'm just gonna finish off with a quick comparison. So in Red Hat 7.1, it's been out since March, you know, having the throughput performance profile is giving you on the order of anywhere between three to 8% out of the box, you know, for a set of different file system tests. These aren't just a, a single run. These are geometric mean of like 14,000 data points on a file system. So, and you also see the relative positioning, we've also moved to XFS as our default. Why? Because it has the largest bars. It's bigger is better in this example. And so we're getting more throughput with XFS. And GFS is our cluster file system. So it's got overhead associated with essentially metadata to, to do locking across multiple nodes. So while it's not, it clearly shows some difference there, it's still a reasonable overhead for a cluster file system. And with that, I'm going to switch over to Bill Gray to step you through NUMA. Yep. Thanks, Chad. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about NUMA and, uh, and what, what that's about and some of the implications of NUMA and how to know whether you have a good workload uh, to be tuned for NUMA. But first, how many of you, how many of you are familiar with, with NUMA? Can I have a show of hands? OK. Uh, Another question, how much difference do you think it can make in your workload? I'm going to say 10, 40, 100%. Let's have a show of hands for 10, 20, 40, 100. Uh, well, if you watch carefully, I'm going to show you slides for each one of those uh, different, different uh, incremental uh, performance improvements. So. Uh, yeah, first I'm going to talk about spec CPU, and as you probably all know, spec CPU is a very popular benchmark for uh, showing you the performance of um, you know, your, mostly your CPU and memory system on your computer. And this is the history of spec CPU 2006, so we got 10 years there since 2006. 
the red bars are the integer spec rate results, and the blue bars are floating point. And those are the leading x86 benchmarks uh, for each one of those years. Uh, and I'll point out that on the right half of those, nine out of 10 of those bars were achieved on uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. But what I want to show you in this slide uh, to sort of motivate uh, what NUMA is for, you see the green dashed line, that's the, the increase in total uh, logical cores, okay? And in 2006, it was down at four, and now it's up at 36. So it's a huge increase in the number of logical cores on the system. And the spec integer benchmarks have actually kept up with that. And the reason that that's possible is because of NUMA. Uh, moving memory closer to the CPUs so that that memory bandwidth can, uh, can be sustained. Uh, so here's a picture of a typical four node NUMA system. Um, each one of those big squares is a, a NUMA node and each one of those nodes has memory associated with it and some number of cores and they share caches and I'll have, have some more pictures too. The gray lines are uh, TPI links or some other interconnect and um, one of the main points about NUMA is that there's a delay involved with getting memory off of a different node when you want to use it on, on uh, some other node. And that delay comes from, from two places. First of all, you have to go get it, but also if there's lots of processes accessing memory on uh, wrong nodes, there can be contention on those, on those interconnects. Um, so, yeah, to, to answer the, the how does uh, the spec CPU results scale with such a great increase in CPUs, it's because we moved memory uh, closer, distributed around the system, closer to the CPUs. Uh, and like we said, remote memory is slower to access. Um, and sometimes you still need to do manual tuning, uh, especially on older versions of RHEL, but with more recent versions of RHEL 6 and 7, we're actually doing some really exciting things to automate that management. Uh, so some tools to sort of visualize what your NUMA topology is. One of the most common ones is LSCPU, and you can see down at the bottom it lists the NUMA nodes. That stuff up uh, here is more uh, your CPU and what's, what, what the socket is uh, contained of. But then you can see down here the NUMA nodes. Another uh, very valuable command is NUMA control, and there's a dash dash hardware option that lists out the CPUs again per node and also shows you how much memory is contained in each NUMA node. Down here, this matrix that's in red, that's the ACPI SLIT information, S-L-I-T, it stands for System Locality Information Table. But what it shows you is how much it costs to get memory remotely. And you can see on the diagonal, uh, it's normalized to 10. So if you're on node zero and you're getting memory from node zero, uh, it it's a relative cost of one. But if you're getting it from any of the other nodes, it takes 2.1 times as long to get that memory. Here's uh, another very valuable tool for visualizing your NUMA system, LS Topo, and that's in the HW Loc GUI uh, package. This is just one NUMA node, um, but it shows you um, the whole node in the big box. It shows you caches, uh, and some of them are shared for the cores. And then down here, it shows you the cores with, with the hyperthreads. And also, LS Topo is a very good tool for showing you that your devices are attached to uh, one of your NUMA nodes. And that's important to know uh, sometimes. Uh, so tips for good NUMA performance. Never disable a NUMA. Um, some systems have a bias option to set memory for interleaving. Never set that. Uh, if you do, you're basically lying to your operating system about the topology of the system and things are going to go much slower and the OS is gonna be um, basically handicapped, have its legs cut off in terms of giving you good performance. Um, there's basically three things you need to understand. Um, your NUMA topology, uh, and we showed you some of those tools that expose that, uh, and knowing what your workload is and uh, how much resource it uses and what kind of data access patterns it has, and I'm gonna talk about that in a, in a little bit but also the basic, basic operations and implications of NUMA. And one of those uh, big implications is that the operating system splits up some resources on a per node basis. And uh, Larry's gonna talk about that for a little while here. Yep. What do we got? The bottom one. 
So um, what I'm going to talk about a little for a few minutes here is the kernel itself maintains per NUMA node resources. So before NUMA, the system maintained a single entity of memory, CPUs, caches, and so forth, interrupt processing, and all the way down. So now what it does is on a per node basis, it maintains uh, groups of CPUs, caches and memory, interrupt processing, zones of memory. So it actually the system, in, in, in addition to that, it has software, kernel threads like KSwapD and lots of other kernel threads on a per NUMA node basis. So a system, a NUMA, node, a NUMA system actually runs like an interconnected bunch of say four systems together and they all interoperate uh, with each other. Um, and as we look at this, so, so if we start out with memory here, memory is in three buckets on, on a Linux system in general. The first 16 megabytes or 24 bits is called the DMA zone. It's for old ISA devices that only supported 24 bits of, of memory. And then the, the, from, the, from that limit up to four gigabytes or 32 bits is called the DMA32 zone. And then above the, uh, that and to the end of RAM is collectively called the normal zone. But on a, on a NUMA system, since we divide memory up into the, the, the nodes, node zero always contains the DMA, DMA32, and normal, normal zone, and then node one and on will contain the, re, the remainder of memory, which we will call the normal zone. So if you have a device that needs to allocate memory out of either the DMA or DMA32 zone, it's always going to allocate out of node zero. So that could introduce some undesirable effects, but that's for old devices anyways. Uh, in, in addition to this, the system, on a, a, the, glo the global page reclamation system works, works, as, where's the, uh, works as follows here. So memory, when memory is introduced into the system, it becomes active and then inactive and then freed as it gets reclaimed. And uh, this kind of flow chart describes how the allocations cause memory to be active and then reactivated. All of this stuff is actually replicated on a per NUMA node basis and they interoperate between each other. So you can actually have, your system can actually have page reclamation, sw active swapping and paging going on on one node with a memory deficit while you have a total abundance of memory on another and it's not doing anything. So you can look at your system in VM status, some of these utilities, and see the system actively reclaiming memory when it looks like there's a whole bunch of it of free memory available. This is normal and the system goes out of its way to sort of balance over time. But if you ran an application that consumed all the memory on all the nodes and then some of them exited and then some of the ones that were running on other nodes bloated, you'd get into a situation like this. Um, also what I wanted to do is talk to, uh, talk to some um, VM tunables I'm going to get into in a little while here. And uh, the, two that, the two that actually have effect on NUMA systems are actually dependent on NUMA, you know, what we call swappiness, which control the aggressive, the, how aggressive the system reclaims memory, anonymous memory via swapping versus reclaiming the page cache memory, and min-free K bytes. Min-free K bytes is your sort of your, your low watermark limits. And then the remaining uh, um, tunables are, are on a system-wide basis, the cache pressure in the dirty ratios and background ratios, those are not dependent on NUMA at all. They just sit there and run on a global basis where the other two up the top are dependent on NUMA. So swappiness, I'll talk about that for a minute. This controls how aggressively the system reclaims anonymous memory versus memory from the page cache, the file system cache. Um, it swaps anonymous memory and system five shared memory, even though system five shared memory is a meta file system, it's in the page cache its backing store is swap space, not, uh, not the file system itself. And then finally, the file pages, those just get simply written back to the file store. This can all happen independently on different NUMA nodes rather than just being global. So once again, you, on a four node system, you can have one node that's swapping and paging and reclaiming heavily while the others are doing little or nothing. Over time, the system will balance this out, but you can get, get side effects of this. So you basically, you decrease this parameter to uh, more aggressively reclaim the page cache memory, and you increase it to more aggressively reclaim anonymous memory. And you'll see this in the, uh, the 2D profiles. This is one of the ones that's adjusted quite, 
quite commonly, and it can affect different pneuma nodes differently. Once again, it can, you can end up causing swapping and paging reclamation on some nodes but not the other. Um, this is, and the last thing I wanted to say is, over time, this, this has become much more automatic. We are much more aggressive in terms of making you not have to tune this. The system re responds to different workloads much more dynamically rather than having to, to, uh, to have you set this. So if it, was, if it was in your profile in RHEL 6, you might see, I'm sorry, in rel 5, you might see it gone in rel 6, in rel 7. And likewise, if it was on in rel 6, you might see it removed from rel 7, just because it's the automatic nature is much more aggressive. Um, the other one that I wanted to talk to is the, the low memory watermark. So how the system works is it has three watermarks, high, low, and min. When, when, the, when the system is above min, I'm sorry, is above high, it does absolutely nothing. As the page, as the, page allocation occurs and the free list is shrunk down to, it has to drop below low. Once this happened, it wakes up a background daemon called k swap d. In a NUMA system, it is one k swap d per node. So this can happen on one node without the other ones. If it goes below this low watermark, it wakes up k swap d and then that NUMA node specific k swap d runs in an attempt to get the pages back up to, uh, up to high. And then finally, if the if the allocation is aggressive enough that K-swap-D cannot keep up and it falls down to min, the, all, the, all the allocations stop and then they are forced to do page reclaiming in addition to K-swap-D and this is what prevents us from falling off a cliff performance-wise. And once again, this happens on a per NUMA node basis now, not just globally. So basically what I've shown here is, is um, the min-free min K-bytes determines how, how how much memory must be on the system without, without uh, this min-free k bytes determines the number of kilobytes that must be available on the system. Below that, only the kernel will run. And as what we can see here is I, I, um, if, you, if you look at this particular system I logged into, it had 90,100 as min-free k bytes. And the, that number is distributed, the sum of these on nodes zero and one, and if it had a large number, larger number, are distributed evenly among, th this number is distributed evenly among the NUMA nodes. And if you increase it, you double it, which is what I did here, it just simply doubles the, the, the watermarks on all the NUMA nodes. So that's how you, that's how the uh, min-free k bytes that you'll see in the 2D profiles work. And then you want to talk about so, so quick pause here. Uh, maybe nobody's ever, no, anybody here run into um, a Linux system that actually runs out of memory at all? Show of hands. <laughs> Never happens. <laughs> oh, that's actually less than we thought. Uh, it's a fairly frequent thing, mainly because Linux uh, uses memory aggressively for the page cache because we think there might be some reuse happening, right? And so reuse is key to get improvements, if you can get it from your page cache, why go to disk and things like that. So important tunables if you do want to affect that. And obviously you can change the tune Ds that we have. Uh, dynamically, all these tune Ds are, you don't reboot in between, and a lot of the, all the tunings that we're going to go through. So back to you, Bill, sorry. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about zone reclaim mode, which is another kernel tunable that's very important to understand if you're, you're running NUMA uh, systems. Uh, so first of all, what it is, uh, it's tunable that tells the kernel what to do when it's trying to allocate memory on a NUMA node and there's not enough available memory left on that node. Right? And there's only two choices, right? You either have to free up uh, and reclaim some memory on that node or you have to go to another uh, NUMA node uh, to get that memory. Uh, and that's what this tunable uh, controls. And so when it's set and there's no more memory on that node, the kernel will reclaim memory um, from that node, and it will take longer to get your memory to allocate it, right? But then, assuming you're accessing it on that node, the actual data accesses will be faster in the long term. Uh, similarly, when you, you clear uh, zone reclaim mode um, and you run out of memory on that node, the kernel will just go to an, another node and get memory, right? So your initial access will be very fast, but you might have a latency penalty uh, later on and maybe forever uh, for the duration of your workload. 
Um, so it's an important thing to know, and I'm going to actually get to talk about zone reclaim for the next several slides. Um, so to see it, you can cat out the value of it, and you can turn it on and off. Um, and something that's important to know is that in RHEL 6.6 and RHEL 7, the default for most, uh, most server systems, except the really big ones, has changed. Um, we found that most people would actually benefit um, because uh, benefit from having zone reclaim clear. Uh, and so uh, the default is actually determined by NUMA distance. If you remember that slit table, that matrix that was in red, um, the required distance to turn this on got larger in, in these versions of, of RHEL. And this can actually make a big difference in, in your applications, right? So we test all sorts of edge cases and stuff in, in, in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Uh, to find out what happens. And, and so I was running spec CPU on a system that doesn't have enough memory. Um, but the wrong setting of zone reclaim mode on the system made a whole bunch of the individual spec benchmarks lose a tremendous amount of performance. There's a whole handful, especially the floating point benchmarks that are below 40% uh, off um, because of the wrong setting. And that performance is restored uh, by changing that setting. So you might wonder, Okay, well, how am I supposed to know how to set this? And I'm, I'm going to talk about that. But by the way, don't, don't run spec CPU with uh, inadequate memory. You're not going to get good results. Um, okay. So basically, you have to ask the question, is, is NUMA data locality more important than uh, filling up my cache and having lots, lots of cache, uh, cache data? And uh, for file servers or maybe uh, database uh, dedicated systems that have a large memory database, um, Basically, you want to use the cache as much as you can, and you don't, you don't want to be clearing it. Um, but the second main big, big section here, uh, if you know that your system, your workload can be partitioned and fit in the NUMA nodes, then that's actually a good candidate for NUMA tuning, and I'm going to talk about uh, a lot more about those kinds of applications. But you need to know, um, basically, which one of these situations uh, you, you are in, what your environment is and what you're doing. And, uh, so here we go. So if your workload is a large monolithic process, like a big in-memory database, um, and especially if you don't know what the access pattern is going to be, like uh, on a large system running the database, you might have be accessing memory that's on many different nodes, and it's an unpredictable thing. Um, that's not really a good uh, candidate for NUMA tuning. And that's also a situation where you should leave uh, zone reclaim mode off because you want to fill up the cache, you want to use the cache, and you're probably not going to be able to do uh, fine grain NUMA tuning with it anyway. But if you have multiple processes, like you're doing the server um, consolidation, or especially if you're running like virtual guests, and if those virtual guests can each fit inside of a NUMA node, or you have some other kind of uh, application or workload where um, the individual processes can take a fractional subset of the system, and those are very good candidates for NUMA tuning, and that's the kind of thing I'm going to talk about. And those are, the, those are the kinds of workloads that should have the memory and the CPUs and the devices even aligned in the same NUMA node for best performance. Um, so here's kind of a checklist uh, uh, of things to consider and tools. Uh, one little known feature, a recent version to top, uh, I don't know if you know, you, if you run top and you press a 1, you get to see a per CPU load. Well, now if you press 2, uh, that's grouped by NUMA node. And if you press a 3, it'll ask you which NUMA node you want to look at, and it'll zoom in on a particular NUMA node. That's kind of a handy feature. And I'm going to talk about some of these other uh, tools in subsequent slides here. Uh, NUMA control. Uh, we mentioned that before, NUMA control dash dash hardware to see your NUMA topology. But is also extremely valuable for making a static allocation of resources to your job, your, to your workload. And you can do that basically by specifying um, what memory nodes you want to run it on and what CPUs you want to use. Um, and here's some examples over here. So uh, for these examples on, on the right-hand side, the workload that I'm running is another NUMA control command, right? NUMA control show, which is says uh, display where I am on the system, right? So I use NUMA control to put it someplace, and then I use NUMA control show to show where it is. And in this case, I'm putting it on uh, node 6. 
And you can see, sure enough, when it runs, um, using the CPUs on Node 6 and the memory on Node 6. Uh, an important point about NUM control, you can actually use a device um, to specify a node instead of a node number. And that's what these two examples are here. This one's not too, example, uh, not, not too exciting because uh, uh, the slash data, the data was on node zero, so it doesn't show too much there, but it does bind it to just the CPUs on node zero. This one's a little more interesting in that the network device was on node two, right? And so if I were, were running a, a job that used that network device a lot, I might want to run that command and have NUMA control bind it to the NUMA node where that device is. And then down here, you can uh, use NUMA control to specify memory policies. Uh, interleaving memory uh, over all, all the CPUs or subset of the CPUs, and that's what that example shows. And uh, if you have certain monolithic um, workloads, like large memory databases, uh, sometimes it might be appropriate to interleave the memory that gets allocated for that workload. And you can do that, um, do that with, uh, let's see, you can do that with uh, NUMA control uh, dash interleave. Numastat's a command that Red Hat uh, rewrote uh, since um, version 6.4. And what it does is it shows your distribution of process memory across the Numa nodes. It's very helpful to understand that. As Larry mentioned, sometimes you could be out of a resource on one node, but still the, the whole um, system looks like you actually have memory. Um, but by default, Numa, Numastat does what it uh, always used to do, and I'll have an example of that. But any command line arguments, um, for Numastat will invoke its new, new behavior. So here's two examples of Numastat. Um, uh, so Numastat dash C uh, QMU. So what, what that's gonna do is look at the system for all the QMU processes, and then it's gonna show where the memory is um, for that process across the four Numa nodes in this case, right? And you can see in the top half of the screen, uh, the process memory was distributed across all of the Numa nodes. Um, so those processes were not aligned. Um, they were going to be incurring latent, high latency accessing memory. And then after um, those QMU processes were managed and, and uh, NUMA affinity um, was forced on these processes, the alignment was done. You can see that the memory for each one of the processes is in a separate NUMA node. And that um, isolates those processes so they don't interfere with each other. And it also localizes those processes so that you get the least, the least latency memory accesses, so you're going to get the best performance. Um, CPU uh, sets, um, which is a kind of C group, and Larry's going to talk a lot about C groups later, um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it's another way that you can do effectively what you did with uh, NUMA control, which is set up a static grouping of your CPUs and your memory. Um, and there's commands over there. Larry's going to go over this more, so I'll skip on. Uh, in this case, this is the default output of Numastat. It just shows you some uh, kernel stats about uh, where the accesses were happening. And in this case, you can see that this uh, job right here was placed on the same node, and the, the, the CPUs that correspond to it. And so in this case, where you have the, the so-called correct bindings, that is the, the job is aligned, the CPUs and memory are on the same node, uh, you can see that the NUMA hit count went way up. And over here, um, you're intentionally using memory from uh, node one, while CPUs are still from node zero, and you can see the uh, CPU miscount went way up. Larry will talk a lot more about C groups in a minute. A little footnote on KSM. How many of you are familiar with the KSM daemon? A few, not very many, okay. Well, so KSM can be extremely helpful if you have to run a bazillion virtual guests on a system. Um, and it can save a lot of memory by looking for pages of memory that are exactly the same and merging them. Um, and you can run many more uh, virtual guests on your system than you would normally be able to if you weren't oversubscribing resources. This is a performance talk though, so that's something you would do if you were mostly concerned about getting the most capacity out of your system, um, not the best performance. Right? If you want the best performance, don't oversubscribe your resources. Um, because when uh, KSM merges those memory pages, 
Sometimes it does them across NUMA nodes, and then you're going to end up accessing memory that's on remote NUMA nodes, and it's going to be slower uh, than if it's accessing the memory locally. And there are some other costs to using KSM. Again, it's very valuable if you need to run a lot of guests. Otherwise, you might not want to. Uh, important note here, though, there's a tunable that says don't merge uh, the memory pages across NUMA nodes, and that might be appropriate to set. By default, um, I think it's on. Uh, so if you have a large NUMA system and a lot of guests, you might want to consider uh, turning that off. Uh, okay. So. A couple of the examples. So, if you, QEMU, if, if you're familiar with KVM, those are the processes associated with a virtual guest with KVM. So, uh, yeah, uh, sorry. No, no problem. But that so guests tend to occupy a lot of memory and a lot of CPUs, cores, and stuff. So, so they're actually a very good target for uh, both the manual tuning as yeah. well as some of you're about ready to jump into the automatic tuning. Yeah, Vir virtual guests are a great candidate for uh, NUMA alignment tuning. Uh, one of the best. And here's sort of a conceptual picture of what the Numistat output was showing before with the unaligned processes and then uh, doing something with Numa management to align uh, so that the memory and the, C and the CPUs, exe the execution threads are all on the same nodes. And uh, there are two, two things that Red Hat has done. Um, NumaD in RHEL 6 and uh, some automatic NUMA balancing uh, technology in RHEL 7 that sort of automate the NUMA tuning for you so you don't have to, you don't have to manually use uh, NUMA control or C groups uh, anymore to do that. Uh, so NUMA-D since RHEL 6.4, it's an optional user-level daemon. It's not on by default. But what it does is it looks for large processes and it looks for where resources are available on a system and it tries to move the process to the node that has the resources. And uh, it responds dynamically to changing load on the system. So if you start guests and you stop guests, it should rebalance the system and uh, keep the new alignment uh, in sort of a semi-optimal uh, state. There are a bunch of tunables. You can look at the man page if you're interested. Um, by default, it tries to maintain some resource margin on each NUMA node. Um, and also has a pre-placement feature that LibVirt can use to say, where should I put this guest that I'm about to launch? And uh, NUMA-D will tell it that. And that's in rel, since RHEL 6.4, RHEL 6 and RHEL 7. Um, with RHEL 7, uh, even better than NUMA-D, uh, the kernel, uh, does automatic NUMA balancing, and it does it by occasionally, it has this sort of a sampling technique where it occasionally unmaps a bunch of pages, and then it sees where they're used when, when, when they uh, fault back in. And a nice side effect of that is the memory that doesn't get used isn't seen, right? So it, doesn't, it ignores that. Um, and then it efficiently moves memory around, and it can do both moving execution threads to where the memory is and moving memory to where the execution threads is. And it has much more, uh, much better fine-grained control uh, than NUMA-D uh, has in RHEL 6 and RHEL 7. NUMA-D is best for when you, when you already know that you have things like virtual guests that you want to have uh, uh, NUMA aligned. Um, okay. So you might ask, well, so what kind of difference does this make? Well, it, it makes a lot of difference. I already mentioned that, that there were examples in here of 10%, 40%, 100%, right? So here we see a 25% gain in SAP uh, due solely to the automatic uh, in-kernel NUMA balance. Um, and you can say, well, yeah, on this end of, of the graph over here for low user counts, it's only, what, I don't know, well, I guess with only 20 users, which is extremely small, you still get a 10% gain. But for more uh, typical use, you get over a 25% improvement uh, in the performance of the application automatically for free out of the box with uh, RHEL 7 that has the autonomic balancing. Um, okay. And so you might ask, so which, which of these NUMA management tools am I supposed to use? Am I supposed to use NUMA control or C groups or NUMA D or the automatic stuff? And the answer mostly is it doesn't matter, right? So ignore the dotted lines on this graph for a second and just look, here's a bunch of lines up here and here's a line down here. So that red line is no NUMA management, right? All the rest of these lines, which represent several different ways of doing NUMA management, 
are all about double the performance for this workload that uh, an unmanaged NUMA uh, environment will give you. And the data lines, by the way, are standard deviation, so it's a lot more consistent and smooth and reliable uh, with NUMA management. Uh, things just, just work a whole lot better. Um, the green line by default up here is that is the automatic NUMA management, and you can see that that is just about as good as any other uh, NUMA management technique in uh, RHEL 7, for this workload at least. Um, okay, so a summary of the NUMA, NUMA stuff. Um, with RHEL 6.4 and, and later, you can use NUMA-D uh, for, for good NUMA candidates, and, and you can get pretty automatic uh, balancing and uh, affinity of, of your memory and CPUs. And with RHEL 7, uh, most people are gonna get good performance out of the box. Now, there are some cases where that's not um, true, depending on what's happening. Um, but for most users, uh, it'll be good performance out of the box, and your, your new management concerns will be mostly taken care of. Uh, again, that is for um, good candidates for NUMA management, right? Remember large in-memory databases or file servers or something where the, where the resources used by the workload basically consume the whole system? Obviously, you can't put that in a subset in, in one or two or half the NUMA nodes because right, it takes the whole system. Um, but anyway, uh, new management is being automated by Red Hat and especially valuable in a dynamic situation. NUMA control and C groups are relatively static. Right? If your workload changes, the system's not going to realign uh, your load. But with NUMA-D and the automatic stuff in RHEL 7, it gets taken care of for you. And I think that's it for NUMA stuff. So Larry, back, back to you. So I'm just going to talk for our a couple of minutes about the Linux scheduler. Um, the, there are a few scheduler tunables that we'll see in the, uh, the TuneD profile. I just wanted to go over what they are and what they mean. Um, the Linux scheduler maintains multiple what we call RB or red black trees as run queues and for, for each socket and core that it, that it maintains. The, uh, some of the, um, in RHEL 6 and 7, um, you'll see in, uh, that basically the the quantum increased, um, we, we have to increase the quantum. It had a lower quantum, which gives us a better latency at the cost of throughput. So in order to, you'll see in the 2D profiles, if you have a throughput versus latency profile, it'll increase the, uh, the, um, the, the, the quantum via uh, the uh, um, SCED min gran granularity and SCED wake up granularity. And this is just sort of a, a guideline about how you go about this rather than going over it. All of this will be available. We'll make all these slides available rather than spending a lot of time going over this. Basically, we double or triple these, uh, these numbers in order to get the same level that we had in RHEL 5 if, you, if, you, if the goal is a, is a throughput goal versus latency. So, so the, um, the quantum now can be dynamically changed with, again, without rebooting. In Red Hat 5, you're, you're stuck with, um, essentially it's a config option, right? Yep. And, and so it is dynamic now, which is uh, pretty useful to, uh, Right, to be again, able to control the, and that once again, that, that is, an, uh, is a trade-off between latency and throughput. Um, load balancing, what load balancing is, is the system, um, if you have a very well-loaded system, it's possible, so you have load averages significantly greater than one on all the CPUs and nodes, it's possible for some of them to exit, and now all of a sudden you have idle CPUs, and you have other CPUs that had load averages significantly larger than one, so you're only using a fraction of the system. Um, so that's also a trade-off, though. If you immediately migrate the, the processes over, to the idle CPUs, you'll be subject to cache problems, cache latency problems, and to NUMA interprocessor, interprocessor or internode uh, performance uh, consequences. So basically the, the SCED migration cost is a tunable that is, that's the amount of time that, it, that it, the system gives, that, that's the amount of time that the scheduler gives the system before it says, okay, I'm gonna shuffle the deck here. We've had a lot of idle CPUs and a lot of overused CPUs. Once this happens, though, you start getting other, other uh, the, the dynamic uh, um, uh, 
NUMA balancer inside the kernel running as well. So they're all sort of interconnected. These are just some of the tunables that you'll see changed in the, in the profiles. And these are other, this is a description of, of what they do and why you'd want to change them again. Um, and another one is called the fork behavior, uh, the child fork, child runs first. This controls whether or not the parent or child runs first on a given CPU. If you fork a child in, uh, the, in rel 5, the child ran, ran first, and rel 6 and 7, the parent continued running. And this actually, there was actually a set of benchmarks and set of, not just benchmarks, but applications that this had consequences for, especially if all the systems are, all the CPUs are heavily used. And so there are times in which the TuneD profiles will change this so that it, the behavior is closer to rel 5. Um, then I'm going to go into page sizes here. Um, some of the other things we, some of the other tunables that we're careful of are the, the, uh, are the page sizes. So the, the Intel systems support three different page sizes, four kilobytes, two megabytes, and one gigabyte. And there are ways that in which these are reserved and, and used. So um, the standard two megabyte, the, by default the system use, uses four kilobyte pages. And what we try to do is to automatically get it to use larger, page, larger pages if possible. The reason we do this is the internal translation tables or translation look aside buffer. Each entry in the buffer controls the mapping of a virtual page to a physical page. And it really doesn't matter the size. If we're using large pages, that single, that single entry uh, maps a larger number of, uh, of a larger amount of memory, so you will incur fewer TLB misses and gain a higher performance uh, if, if the system can do that. So, so the standard two megabyte huge pages are used for system five shared memory. Um, these are reserved via Proxys VM and our huge pages. So if you get a database application and it's using uh, system five shared memory with huge pages, this is how the, the, they'll be allocated. Um, you can do it on a per node basis using the sys file system. And these are used via the huge TLBFS metafile system. So system five shared memory uses that, that file system. When it allocates the memory for it, it goes to the pool of pages here and maps those into any address space that is gonna use them. Um, now we also support one gigabyte huge pages. They're in, uh, in RHEL 6 and early version RHEL 7, RHEL 7.0, these had to be reserved at boot time and there was no fraying. So there's a boot time argument that says, I want, say, eight one gig huge pages, and they're, they're, they are used for only this until the next reboot, and if you wanted to change it. RHEL 7.1 and beyond allows runtime allocation and deallocation of one gig huge pages. And these are also used via huge TLBFS. And then finally, we have what we call transparent huge megabyte, transparent huge pages. These are two megabyte huge pages that are used for anonymous memory, for stacks, heaps, data, and BSS sections. And this is all transparent. The system uses it if it can. If it can't, it uses smaller pages. If it uses large pages and later on it runs out of memory, it starts chopping these big pages into smaller pages in order to, to feed the, the memory hog that is, is causing the problem. Um, and yeah. this is on by default, it's used for anonymous memory and there are cases in which we shut it off for certain types of applications. If you have an application has a very sparse address space and it only touches a few uh, bytes in, the, in a large virtual address space, using two megabyte pages is gonna instantiate two megabytes at a time versus four kilobytes. So there's a performance consequence to that. Um, so this is how Larry, you, just Yep. Just to pause here, so why not just go to one gig huge pages everywhere, but the, the reality is that the hardware vendors still don't necessarily support the same number of TLB entries when you use a two meg page versus a one gig page. So translation buffers are actually built in silicon with actual number of wires and gates and you just can't necessarily build this, the associativity of a, of a cache uh, with it. So, so there's a trade-off, right? You don't get as many one gig huge pages, you know, in a physical hardware that you got when you had two meg pages. So, so definitely your mileage varies. Our automatic tools are today promoting things to a two meg. Yep. So transparent, uh, right. as Larry said. The, the, like Jack said, as the systems uh, mature, more and more TLB entries are used for 
right. the variable for all different page sizes. So basically, what, the, what this is here is it's, it's a description of how to use the standard two megabyte huge pages. You can do it on a per system basis through the sys file system. You say echo 2000 into there. It'll take and you, it'll grab pages off the free list and put them in the huge page free list. And then when you run a program that uses them, system five shared memory example I did right here, you can see that it used the pages that, that, that you put aside for it. And you can free them then later on when you're done with them, you can just echo a zero into NR huge pages and they'll go, all go back on the free list and be usable by everybody else. Um, you can allocate on a per node basis by using the sys file system instead. So th in this particular example, uh, you can see that I, um, I use the generic uh, system-wide allocation technique. And what it did is it, uh, I put 1,000 of them in there, and it, di it divvied, them, divvied them up 500 in each of the two nodes. But then I reset it to zero, and then I echoed 1,000 into just one of the nodes. And then as you can see, it, it only allocated on the, that specific node. So if you have a database or a set of databases that you're running on your system, you're going to run them on a per node. You're going to bind them to specific nodes. You want to make sure that you allocate the huge pages down there as well. A lot of the startup scripts and so forth will do all this stuff for you in the databases. And this is what this means. And if, and if you run into a problem in which you see uh, um, a lot of NUMA collisions and so forth, this is one of the first places to look. Um, the one gigabyte huge page, this was used, this, this is specific to RHEL 6 and RHEL 7. RHEL, all RHEL 6 and RHEL 7.0. It had to be allocated at boot time with these boot time parameters. You can see I allocated six of them here. When I did that, it took eight gigabytes of memory away from the system and made it only available to the huge TLBFS file system. If we mount it and we run something, you can see that it used the, the, um, the, the free count went from eight to zero, so it actually used them. In order to get this memory back, you have to reboot your system and remove this from the boot line. So in RHEL 7.1 and beyond, we support dynamic per node allocation and deallocation of the one gigabyte huge pages. So you can see there's, there's no p huge pages allocated. I said, what I did, as I said, I wanted to allocate eight of them on node zero and uh, there was eight of them available, so there's eight on node zero, zero on node one, and then finally when I freed them, it, I didn't have to reboot the system at all, it just went and freed all of those pages back to the, back to the system. So this is available in, uh, this is a really big advantage in RHEL 7.1 of not needing to reboot. There's a lot of applications that would like to use these, but before 7.1, it required a reboot in order to get this memory back. Um, transparent huge pages, this is the, the, the system that, the subsystem that allocates two megabyte pages for anonymous memory. And you can see basically if you echo, an, if it's on by default, but if you echo a never into there, um, and I run a program, I just say allocate 15 gigabytes of memory and dance around in memory. It, uh, it, in this particular case, it took like 12 seconds to run, uh, the, yeah, 12 seconds of real time to run. You can see the memory, there was no anonymous huge pages in use. And if I re-enabled it by saying always on the, on the runtime uh, parameter uh, and run the same program over again, the, the runtime went from 12 seconds to seven seconds. This is all because the, the, there's a significantly fewer TLB misses and the management of the pages are much more efficient. Um, and so there's a, those are the speed up of you know, almost a factor of two. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is C, is C groups. The, the C groups are the foundation of a lot of what this summit's going to talk about, about the control groups are the foundation for containers and Docker and a lot of other stuff that we're going to get into here. And this is how the kernel manages some of this. Do you want to say anything about this? Um, sure. So yeah, thanks, Larry. We'll give you a little breath here. So, so two things. Um, you know, we're going to summarize a little bit Bill Gray's uh, NUMA talk. So Bill is actually the author of NUMA D, as well as uh, other people at Red Hat. Um, but he's actually added NUMA to as his middle name. So it's Bill NUMA Gray. So if you want to congratulate him on that name change. Uh, Larry also, he's showing a lot of command line stuff. So you can always tell a, a developer from a, from a marketing person. 
And he's showing you the interfaces not through um, our SysCTL parameters, where some, sometimes you can change these on the fly. Larry jumps right into the proc file system, right into the sys, uh, sysfs. Uh, Numistat is actually one of the tools to read that stuff as well. But it's really cool how Linux is architected to basically expose all the performance details you want and to be able to do it at a developer level. He's got the sophisticated programs like, uh, you know, the mem test. The file he, he wrote was called junk. He's got, uh, I don't, he didn't mention when he did the fork test is a, a, now a famous program called fork it that, uh, that he, I don't know if he's got a patent on it, but the point is you can do a lot at the micro benchmark level to understand the performance of your system. And, and again, Linux exposes that to you. So the last topic for this section, and then we'll take a brief break, like I said, five minutes tops. Some people can at least exit, get some, uh, use, use the facilities, etc. But the key thing that uh, Atomic is gonna do, Jeremy's gonna be on for the next session with Atomic, it's gonna be manipulating these C groups with tools like Docker and Atomic and containers. So with that, we'll keep going with Larry. So what, what C groups are is a, it's a file system in the kernel itself that allows you to subset your system. It allows you to look at all your CPUs and break them up into a smaller groups of CPUs, NUMA nodes, memory, um, CPUs, bin, um, disk I.O., network I.O. It allows you to break it, break it all up. So if you want to, in this particular case, so, so when we start, the, the default mount points for the file system and RHEL 6 and RHEL 7 are different. I just list the mount points. As you can look at this stuff after. There's no sense in burning up time here. But here's, a, here's, a, just a, here's an example of, I have a, a, a 16 gigabyte 8 CPU system. It's just a small system in my office and I wanted to cre create a subset of it that was two gigabytes and four CPUs basically one of the NUMA nodes, uh, but, but not all of the memory. So um, I do a CTL, NUMA CTL minus minus hardware to get a picture of what everything looks like. I mount the C groups. I make, make dir, I go down and do a make dir uh, in C groups called test. And this is exactly what the, um, the Docker and, and so forth do. They're not gonna be called test. They're gonna be called some other non-human non readable thing. And uh, um, then what it's going to do is it's going to, it's going to set up the ability to use uh, NUMA nodes. It's going to create a subset of the number of CPUs. So what this does is it says use node zero, CPU zero to three, and two gigabytes of memory is the amount of memory I want on this thing. And then finally, this, what this example down here does is it says every other program, every other process is is created by this shell is to go be a member of the C group. So when I do this, you can see that uh, um, this is, so I run a, a program here with, a, with 110 processes, each consuming 20 megabytes of memory, and you can see that it runs in only half the system in that particular C group that I created. The other C group, the other half of the system is totally idle and available for whatever you want to use it use it for. In addition to this, um, I think it's on the next slide. Um, no, that's the, um, it, um, I'm, it, you, it only used uh, two megabytes of the memory here. Or I thought I had it in here someplace. It's on, a, it's on a slide coming up. But it only, since I restricted it to two megabytes of memory, even though 20 times 110 exceeds that, it's, it's not going to allow this, that C group to use any more memory and it's actually going to start swapping. So in this case, this is the same slide that Bill talked about earlier. In, in this example that I used, I would have had the correct bindings. I have node zero, CPUs zero to three if, are on node zero. And if I do a NUMA stat as this runs, you can see that the hit ratio, the NUMA hits goes up from 16 to 27, to, from 1.6 million to 2.7 million, in that, the, that the, the, the misses don't go up at all. But if I do incorrect bindings here, if I say I want to allocate the memory on node, node one, but the CPUs, I want everything to run on node zero, then what's going to happen here is we're going to do just the opposite. We're going to have high miss ratios and low hit ratios. Um, the, the 
the, there's a lot of scheduling cap capacity or capability in C groups as well. So a couple of examples of this that you'll see used are what we call shares. So what you can do is you can, in one of these C groups, you can say, I want, I want to have only, um, say, 1% of the C CPU available for um, a given C group. And so in that particular case right here, the C group, um, where are we here? Uh, the, the, all, it, the basically, even though, basically the, that C group is only consuming 1% of the system in this example, whereas if I, if I didn't restrict it, it gets, it gets just as much CPU as every other C group in the system. And then finally, uh, let's see, what do we want to say? Did you want to say something about this, Shaq? Well, this just shows how dynamically you can alter with C groups. You can alter essentially how either the shares or in this case, say during the day, you want uh, the red application to have lower priority than, uh, or instance one to have lower priority and CPU shares for two different Oracle databases running than uh, the blue. Blue might be your OLTP traffic. Red is more decision support. Uh, and then at night, you basically can run a script, uh, cron job or whatever, and essentially give uh, the batch processing. So the database doesn't come down, the C groups, you know, you don't have to do any manipulation and tuning at the database level, you can do it at the OS level and essentially dynamically affect the performance of um, multiple applications. Okay, so the previous example was the CPU shares. What you can do is you can say, I want to give this C group only 1% of the system. But if, the, if there is more capacity available to it, if, there's, if nobody else is using those CPUs, it'll allow that C group to consume as much CPU as it wants. That's in contrast to what we call the quota system. With a quota system, you can say, I, o I want this particular C group to only have a specific number of, uh, uh, I only want this to, ha to have a specific amount of CPU, even if all the rest of them are idle. So in this case right here, there's two variables associated with it. There's the period and the quota. So the, if the period is set to 100,000 and the quota is set to negative one, then it's gonna consume as much CPU as it wants. It's, it's not gonna be restricted at all. But if, but if in a C group you set the period to 100,000 and then you set the quota to 1,000, it's only gonna receive 1,000 divided by 100,000 or 1% 1 of the CPU, even if the rest of the CPU is totally idle. So this would be used on something that you're billing part of your, your customers or something to, to, to do. And you can see that even though the system is idle, is 99% idle, it still doesn't let that C group's CPU consumption exceed whatever you set up in, as the quota. And this is all used in these, uh, the um, Docker and the uh, containers. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to talk about uh, inside of a C group, if you allocate, the, the way that the OOM kills code works inside of a C group, if you restrict the C group to um, a given size, so the, if, you, if the memory plus uh, um, swap is set to say two gigabytes and you overcommit memory, the system is gonna start swapping and paging. And then it'll get to the point where uh, if, you, if I try to run a program here that um, tries to run, it tries to consume 16 gigabytes, what's gonna happen is it's going to consume the two gigabytes that you gave it, and then it's gonna run out of memory, and then rather than continuing swapping and paging and consuming swap space, it hits that limit, and then it OOM kills those processes, just like it was running on a two gigabyte system. So in that case, that's what happens, that, that, what, what it looks like is you see the output of VM stat where it goes down, it consumes your two gigabytes of swap space and then the, the D message, in D message you will see that it was killed as a result of, of this, this memory limit and it'll tell you that it, it was killed because of memory plus swap was exceeded and it tells you exactly why and how that was done. And then uh, right. I think that was the last of the... Yeah. And so, you know, quick summary here again. The, um, so this, the other two dimensions not described, uh, there's both uh, network C groups and there's um, disk C groups. And 
We're going to explore some of those in, in the next talk. But the idea is it's not just CPU memory. Uh, Larry's a VM guy and a uh, CPU guy. But now these C groups actually extend out to namespaces in disk, network, and actually file system namespaces. So, um, so Jeremy's going to step through that at the end. The, the tools in RHEL 6, applications like KVM and Rev actually implement Use, utilize these C group infrastructures. So we showed you man, manual ways to tune it. And of course, more and more, a lot of the other talks at the summit and clouds are basically building upon this infrastructure. So um, we'll, we can take five minutes if there's a, a five minute break, or if people have uh, brief questions around the top, um, when to use, you know, what our automatic tools are doing in the top section versus manually tuning, we never will take that away from you. So, so probably it's worth just taking a break and bringing your questions to uh, Joe Mario's session in, in room 206. Um, but during the break, if anybody does have a brief question, we're happy to answer. Thank you. So the mystery man here who's been a little quiet is going to take the floor here to, uh, to kick right in on uh, Red Hat Linux Atomic Host. Mystery man's been quiet because my voice is shot. <clears throat> Sorry. Partly. So we'll blame, my, we'll blame my youngest son, Kevin, who gave me something on the way, out, on the way up here. <laughs> um, there's plenty of people still mingling in. Um, one thing I wanted to do is, uh, and he won't mention it himself, but it's, it's Shaq's birthday today, so happy birthday. And uh, also, my, <clears throat> also my lovely wife's birthday, so I don't know what that means, but anyway. <laughs> So, okay, so you all, from, you all remember me from a couple of years back uh, doing this talk and, and um, so was a lot of talk about low latency networking for the stock exchanges and, and it's kind of funny because the same techniques we're using in entirely different areas now. We'll get into them towards the end of the presentation. What I wanted to start off with is my new, the new hotness, right? How many folks are planning to use containers? How many folks are already using containers? Have you guys, are you using RHEL? For your containers? Okay. Today, Red Hat announced Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux Atomic Platform. Last year at Summit, <clears throat> we announced Atomic Host. Atomic Host is a single system. Platform includes multi system orchestration of containers across multiple physical systems. So, host is a, a, host is a uh, building block on top of which platform is built. So, this slide doesn't say platform because I didn't know which keynote they were going to actually launch it. But uh, anyway, so to give you an idea of what Atomic is, if anyone's uh, heard, there's some recent trends towards container-optimized Linux distributions, and there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that we've already taken care of for you. Um, we like to think our, our distribution performs the best, and some of the numbers tend to bear that out. Um, and we've got some great data coming up in a few slides. So what Atomic is, is um, it's based on something called OS tree, which is like Git for operating system binaries. It's, uh, uh, it allows you to uh, update the system in an atomic fashion. It's kind of where its name comes from. Um, so that you can, uh, and also you can roll back. So you do these transactional system updates in, an, in sort of an image thing. You can't really, it's kind of funny because when you log in and you type yum, it actually doesn't even work. So there's no yum on these boxes. Uh, the idea being this is a totally API addressable operating system. You're never really supposed to unless you need a debug, which I have some good news for you on that. But <clears throat> you're never supposed to really log into this thing unless there's some kind of a failure scenario. Uh, the idea being you talk to Docker's API or Kubernetes API, Systemd's API over some network connection. Uh, and so the logging in really doesn't come into play. And this is, again, in theory. So if you need to install a piece of software on a rel atomic host, uh, you install a container. You don't actually install software on the bare metal uh, or on the operating system itself. You install a container that's got that software in it. If you haven't seen how containers work, they're super, super duper easy to use. Um, Red has uh, thrown all of our weight behind the uh, Docker image format, which if you sat through the Intel keynote today, uh, someone mentioned the Open Container Project. What that is is Docker donating their image format to the open source community, and uh, there's going to be some sort of standards body around it, which we love, of course, because if we were all about avoiding proprietary lock-in. Anyway, back to Atomic. Um, the, 
the folks already introduced Tune D. Jack introduced Tune D earlier, and uh, it's kind of spilled into every project or every product that Red Hat's trying to sell uh, to you folks or offer. Uh, Atomic's no different. OpenShift is no different. Gluster, we got one coming for Ceph. Um, Shack will get into the ones that we have for real time and NFV use cases later, which is what I alluded to when I mentioned uh, the low latency networking guys, because the tuning is really, really similar. So this is the guts, or this is the inheritance, um, yeah, you know, pro, a pro, uh, profile inheritance for the Rel Atomic systems. Throughput performance, which is the default in Rel 7. Uh, and then we've got two new profiles, either Atomic Host, if it's running on bare metal, or Atomic Guest, if it's running inside KVM. We're distributing cloud images for, uh, for Atomic, so you can just, uh, you can download like a 300 and 400 megabyte image and then, and then you know, install it inside KVM, uh, Vert Manager, something like that. We also, do, we also ship OVAs for use in vSphere. Uh, what else? Several other image formats, ISOs, of course. So you can install it in your environment and uh, you automatically get these profiles. <clears throat> I don't actually have a slide about what they, what they really do, but what they allow you to do is pack a, a lot more containers onto each um, onto each node. So who sat through the demo uh, that the OpenShift and Feed Henry guys did yesterday? Was anyone there? Only a handful? That's how I lost my voice. I was trying to pawn it off on my kid, but I was so excited to see that demo because we had worked <clears throat> on the back end of some of that to allow those containers to scale to, like they did a thousand containers in like you know, 30 seconds, it was nuts. So we have it on YouTube now. I highly recommend you spend a half an hour watching these demos. I'm not gonna ruin it for you, but let's just say wearables were involved, the Feed Henry guys killed it, and, uh, and thankfully they pulled it off without any issues. So, uh, it's on YouTube now, and if you follow hashtag Red Hat Summit, it's, or RH Summit, it's in there on Twitter. Okay, so what we're gonna show you today is some uh, comparisons that we've been doing between bare metal containers. Shaq mentioned containers are kind of new to the fold. Uh, we've been doing bare metal and vert for a long time, of course, six, seven years. Um, and what we're showing you here is some uh, latency tests and, and uh, streaming network tests with the three different permutations. You can see here, most of them on the, on the throughput side is like, great, we're, this is all lovey-dovey, and it's, this is 10 gig networking, you can get 10 gig into a guest without issues. Vert guests, bare metal, containers, no issues on the, on the streaming type of workloads. That's data transfers, copying files from machines, those are kind of uh, streaming tests. For web-based applications, which are normally transactional network uh, patterns, traffic patterns, uh, those are kind of represented by the uh, the round robin tests, and in here you'll see there's some overhead available, uh, some overhead visible for containers uh, and for KVM. So these are out of the box, untuned scenarios. The KVM numbers can be significantly higher. In fact, they can basically be 100%. If and I'll show you some data um, with some with some tuning. So. So in addition to networks, we've done pretty much every application in, uh, in a container. And Shaq had mentioned the word Oracle, and SAP was here today. And you know we work in the R&D kind of, I don't know what you call it, black ops. And so we've done basically all the, all the workloads we've done in VMs and containers. We've, uh, VMs and, and bare metal, we've figured out how to stuff them into a container. Um, even though there's no really chance of it being supported anytime soon. <clears throat> the idea behind running these workloads is that we learn stuff about the operating system, and those are just test tools. So this is SAP's HANA. You mentioned they, they, it's an in-memory database. They talked about it this morning, running inside containers. And you can see it's essentially it's the same performance as bare metal, even though it's inside a container. <clears throat> uh, this is a large OLTP database. You can see here, again, containers usually within 2 or 3% of bare metal. And that's kind of the rule of thumb. It can be zero. It can be, I, think, I don't really think we've seen it higher than five. Um, and those are tests that have a, a fair amount of noise anyway. So it's usually almost no overhead. And if you want to get really off into the weeds, we're going to do that on Friday morning after the pub crawl. If you can drag yourself out of bed, 9.45, set yourself like, I don't know, a six or seven beer limit on Thursday night. And come see me on Friday morning. <clears throat> Okay, this is a, a graph showing multiple workloads. So to give you a sense, if you have a CPU bound load, there generally is not much, if any, overhead for virtual machines, and that's regardless of hypervisor. Syscalls tend to have a, um, 
syscalls tend to have a little bit of an overhead, so it really is app dependent. In this case, it was purely a math calculating primes benchmark. Um, OLTP, we already shared that graph, and then the analytics application is yet another vertically scaling benchmark that you're probably all running. We won't name names, but the point being that um, containers had about a 6% overhead in that one, and that's something we're, we're definitely looking at because it's a little bit higher than, uh, than we expected. Okay, you have. Oops, hello. <laughs> thanks, Jeremy. And uh, so we'll be context switching back to Jeremy in a few seconds. Um, did want to spend a little bit of time um, going through network performance. And um, this, this can actually be like a two hour talk or even a half a day talk. So one, uh, one plug here was uh, we actually have a performance tuning class. It's a week long class on performance. If you want to go to you know, Red Hat uh, 440, I believe it's still for uh, the course 442. is 442. Thanks. And so, so we're not going to cover everything around networking. Uh, traditionally, we go real deep with low latency customers, um, things, trading applications, etc. Because we have a lot of workloads in house. We, we're members of the Stack Consortia, so we run them. But here's some basic uh, things we're doing both in low latency and also how it applies to network functions virtualized. Um, NFV. So one is the same thing that we talked about NUMA for uh, memory and CPU applies to networking. So in this case, where your adapters live on that non-uniform memory environment and being located, having applications and interrupts going to essentially the same NUMA node allow you to get um, essentially local memory access and um, it's a, huge, it's a huge thing for networks in addition to um, you know, what some of the deltas we sh shared before. Um, in, in Red Hat 6, we had a product called MRG, Messaging Real-Time and Grid. That was a way to get real-time kernel and kernel support. Real-time kernels sometimes would, would move forward in time, uh, and they're one of the few, um, because the real-time kernel essentially has the preempt patches. It's actually a different config. Traditionally, Red Hat, we keep the K kernel ABI actually um, locked in for a release of, a major release of RHEL. So RHEL 5, 2.6.18, RHEL 6, 2.6.32, uh, and now we're at the 3.10. Now the kernel moves forward. Don't, don't, don't worry, we're not like stopping, we're not putting any new patches in into Red Hat 6. We will pull patches upstream that go out into all of our active releases as long as they don't break kernel ABI. So long story short is in Red Hat 7.1, we reintroduced a real-time kernel, and this time we're keeping it lockstep with um, essentially the made major release of RHEL. And a couple reasons. It helps keep real-time kernels st stable. We're also working on the network functions virtualized essentially are demanding the determinism of real-time behavior, not just on bare metal, but also in virtual guests. So it doesn't necessarily give you the like top performance, but it helps with the determinism. So Jeremy's gonna step you through some advancements we've done with, with that team. And a lot of that stuff is targeting for KVM, and at least we're targeting 7.2 or 7.x. We're not the product guys, so we'll, uh, we'll have to let them whether it comes tech preview or how it rolls out is, um, but it's important to, to know that we're doing this work with our real-time team and, um, and it really does affect performance. So, um, <clears throat> so again, the top tuning things, there's actually low latency tuning guides on our websites. Uh, the author of many of those is Jeremy. He works with our team for a lot of results, but, but again, he's taken um, proactively making sure we can share that tuning knowledge in our guides and so that you, the customers, can do that. And so what do we do a lot? So a lot of times we check the BIOS, right? The power control greatly affects the latencies of your networks. Um, we're all about being, being able to be, you know, a green company and in fact our idle latency, our idle power is actually industry leader with Intel. Uh, but if you are, do want to tune for latency, uh, having 
the power oscillate in the middle of, say, a network test can can introduce that you know both jitter and some non-determinism. So we want to make sure you at least set the BIOS to control the power at the OS level, so our tunedes can dynamically adjust those on the fly. If you set them, if you don't give the OS control, uh, it we, it's same thing with NUMA. We, it's out of our control if we if we can't alter them at the OS. It's it's a reboot or you know is the only way to change the thing. So, second thing, you know, obviously, um, uh, disk I/O and um, asynchronous events. So we mentioned transparent huge pages. I'm not sure you're going to cover that latency jitter that sometimes the demons looking for pages to aggregate together um, can actually add jitter too. So that's covered in our low latency tuning guides. Uh, but I did want to go back to a quick example with network functions virtualized. So I uh, took a state-of-the-art um, Haswell EP, just a two-socket machine. We took, um, we've seen some enormous claims vendors and partners are are doing with, with uh, NFE. And so our engineering teams, you know, took that as a challenge, plus um, people are open sourcing essentially some of the technology here. So we took, turns out six cards, 12 40 gig ports, and we just tried to, you know, do some gains. Our guys in the lab, we get paid. So here's just a picture of two back-to-back -back systems and see how hard we can drive that. So we first did throughput. We ran it out of the box without significant tuning, and not too shabby. We were able to crack, you know, 300 gigabits per second on two nodes. Most people might say that's cool. You, who would ever need more, etc. But it turns out by applying what we call the NFV tune D that we're working on, and a lot of what's happening here, you know, we basically went from 300 to uh, 421 gigabits per second. A nice jump in performance, probably almost 30%. Uh, I should mention that our team also gets paid in buffalo wings for each percent performance gain they get. So they always like to keep the baselines low. And I actually have to pay for the buffalo wings. So partner last night reminded me of that as I owed him eight wings or for the 8% performance he gave us uh, uh, last year. So now, so this is great because we're, we're getting to to where those six cards were out of PCI limits here. We think we can go further. We have CPU left. We keep digging in with our network team and with our virtualization team to go higher. So that's throughput. So what about some of these other lanes? Huh? Can you actually do, I remember when 10 million packets a second was like, who could possibly want more, right? Well, now we're seeing 100 million, 150 million on a single server driving not just bare metal, driving it in a virtual environment. And so some of that is about kernel, uh, essentially network bypass technologies. Uh, one of the more famous ones is uh, Intel as they open source DPDK. Um, that's recently just been happening over the past couple months and we've been putting that in our trees and we've been testing it with our teams and optimizing. And so when people were making claims of 200 million, uh, Beginning of May, you know, the code was barely running and working and on a single set of ports. And by the end of the May, we had cracked 200 million. And that's the uh, Intel folks shared with us that our config is capable of about 225 million. And with a bit of tuning, bare metal, we are able to hit 218 million packets a second between two systems. Uh, you know, obviously, NFV is a technology um, as software-defined networks, people are building um, essentially network gear out of, out of commodity servers and networks, and they also then want to manage that with OpenStack or Kubernetes, et cetera. So, uh, we, so we measured the same thing with pass-through technology on KVM, and, and we hit 208. With containers, we reduced that small overhead uh, even further to only 215. But, this is where I'll tra transition back to Jeremy. Jeremy and uh, Rashed's team and Andrew Thoyer, they, they did a lot of hard work on this to get this ready. Um, I didn't understand this picture. I'll let Jeremy go in. 
Yeah, he actually thought this was my dog. <laughs> Does anyone know whose dog is? We got a few people. Yeah, well, <clears throat> my dogs are far cuter. OK. <laughs> uh, so one of the things that we're working on in the context of NFE is <clears throat> hitting engineering targets that are, have jitter boundaries that are in just a handful of microseconds. And so with the normal mainline Linux kernel, uh, just due to some of the design of the locking primitives, it's not something we're able to achieve. So luckily we have a staff of engineers uh, already working at Red Hat, phenomenal engineers, that already know the ins and outs of getting this level of determinism. And this is generally for telco at the moment uh, type users, but <clears throat> same type of tuning applies to a latency crowd. So what we did here is just, uh, it's called cyclic test is the name of this benchmark. It was invented to profile the real-time kernel six or seven years ago by Clark Williams. And the same, the same crew is helping us uh, optimize this benchmark right now. So what this graph shows you on the top left is that the mainline kernel has outliers. The purple spike are outliers caused by um, mainly Futex locks in and uh, priority inversion issues with um, kernel threads on the real-time, uh, sorry, the mainline kernel. Those issues are gone when you start using the regular real-time kernel, which as Shaq mentioned, has a, what's called the preempt patch set. So the maximums in the real-time kernel go down from 140 microseconds down to about 11 microseconds. So that's for maximums, and that's well within our engineering targets. And this is the lower level benchmark. We'll scale, out, <clears throat> we'll scale out to different benchmarks as time goes on. And on the bottom right, um, it shows you a little bit more if, if I took the maxes off of the graph. So it's the same data, but plotted differently. Um, you can kind of get a sense of the relative performance of uh, rel uh, the mainline kernel, which is actually really performant, except for the bursts and outliers, which were <clears throat> specifically what we're trying to get rid of, and, uh, and KVM. So KVM, still six, seven microseconds for the 99.9th percentile. Phenomenal latency into a KVM guest. A lot of work by a lot of people. If you want to meet some of those folks, they'll be in 206 at 6 p.m. today, free beer, lots of uh, great uh, Red Hat engineers, kernel guys, user space guys, all going to be there. Please show up with your questions. Stump the chump. OK, so here's uh, additional data. 10 million samples um, of cyclic tests in the red lines are, are the spikes that we saw over that test run, which is for an hour. So the blue and green at the bottom are extremely quiet, very little jitter. And uh, those are fully tuned systems. Now, to get to there was a really, her I'm going to say heroic, but it was a very difficult process. <clears throat> so we're going to try and commoditize all of that tuning through our Tune-D profiles so that our customers don't have to go through this hell of tuning their systems. Uh, we'll provide best practices for them and ship it with our products very soon. OK, so switching topics, or this slide is out of order. Um, this slide might, might be out of order. Uh, so anyway, the OpenShift guys did a great demo last night. Um, oh, it's here because it's sort of networking related. Uh, we were just talking handfuls of microseconds. When you step back up to the application level, <clears throat> you generally can't count that, that many microseconds. So and in fact, it turns out that uh, the latency benchmarks we're running with JMeter on OpenShift right now turned out to be in the handfuls of milliseconds. So a fact of three orders of magnitude greater uh, in terms of latency. And even still not perceptible to, perceptible to the human eye, but to a packet going across the network and maybe several packets in a long train, the NFE guys need to pump through uh, and maintain quality of service, and they don't want the disruption. You don't want people to sound like me on the phone, right? So <clears throat> what we've done here is, is blast the systems over 10 gig links. That are, these are all Apache running in containers on Atomic, uh, OpenShift containers running on Atomic and Docker and the whole thing. <clears throat> Blasted with HTTP traffic, measured around trip times, and provided some statistics based on how many containers uh, we are uh, loading onto the system. So, for the folks that want to run containers, if they're already running them, can you give me a sense of where you fit on this plot? Uh, are you more towards just a handful of containers on each machine, or you really <clears throat> you really want to get very dense, a hundred more? Who wants to run less than fifty? Who wants to run more than a hundred? The folks that want to run more than 100 are going to benefit from the uh, 2D profiles that we have for Relatomic. There's some SE Linux fixes in there. There's some uh, NF tables or net filter um, fixes in there. 
in order for us to get to many thousands of containers on each node, those are some of the limits. PID max is something that we changed. It, it all depends on your workload. But those are things that, that um, got most of the tunable limits out of the way in those profiles. Additionally, we had to do a lot of stuff with the block layer. <clears throat> that the block layer and the kernel in order to allow us to put a thousand, uh, thousand file systems on the same server or 5,000 file systems on the same server. So those are all in RHEL 7 already, those fixes. Similar to DPDK, which Shaq was outlining, uh, other vendors have similar technologies and have had for a while. WireDirect from Chelsea Owens. SolarFlare's got EFVI. Mellanox uh, talks about InfiniBand or, or uh, Rocky technology, which is another form of kernel bypass. So there's, DPDK is not the only game in town. They just happen to have the name Intel, so they get a lot more props for it. Um, this is benchmarks for running open onload, which is a, uh, again, SolarFlare's kernel bypass into a container. There's a white paper on this, which is available down on the show floor. It's 10 pages, really short show you how to tune the heck out of a system and get super low latency into a container. Those, those tunings are um, applicable outside of the, the low latency kind of uh, world, so the paper may have a more generic use. If you are interested in low latency network tuning outside of uh, kernel bypass and stuff, we also have another white paper down there, which, um, which you can pick up a physical copy of or you can grab it off, of, uh, <clears throat> grab it off the customer portal, Reddit. Red Hat's customer portal. So what we're seeing on this graph is that we can basically do, for, uh, if you look at the, uh, let's say the 99th percentile of uh, uh, UDP round robin, which is the third set of bars from the left, about five microseconds round trip uh, into a container and out using open onload. The kernel is actually not that far behind. Uh, it's usually about three or four microseconds slower. So, and on the right-hand side, uh, the, the higher bars, slightly higher bars, use SRIOV and KVM. So even KVM is able to keep, keep it under 10 microseconds round trip uh, used in open mode. So super cool technology. We're trying everything we can in containers and kind of throwing stuff against the wall. <clears throat> throwing stuff against the wall. If it sticks, it sticks. I really apologize for my voice. Uh, finally, the la I think there's only one piece of scheduling stuff that I have to talk about today. We talked about this last year. It's brand new for RHEL 7. <clears throat> RHEL 7, we're using it for NFV, which is called uh, No Hertz Full. What that does is get the uh, kernel's timer tick. It helps disable the kernel timer tick on s s however many cores you want. So for NFV, we want the cores to be as close to 100% isolated from kernel activity as possible. And this is one of the major features that helps us get there. So without this feature, we would we would have unbounded latency spikes, even in the real-time kernel, um, that would uh, sort of bust our budget. So this is a major feature. We found a use for it in the stock exchanges, plenty of them running with it. Um, and, uh, and we're going to use it for NFV as well. And the, and the wizards that you'll have a chance to meet later in, in 206 implemented this thing in KVM as well. So you can get ticks, no ticks inside KVM, no ticks on the host, no ticks in the guest. It's pretty sick. So at the end of the day, we're able to get to latency or packets per second numbers like Shaq showed, over 200, very close to 200 million packets per second. By the way, that's 64 byte UDP. Another latency technology new to RHEL 7, actually backported to RHEL 6, requires driver enablement. It's called busy polling. A lot of driver manufacturers or hardware manufacturers that sell NICs have implemented something like this already. It's actually available in the kernel, and it's available for, I don't know, Mellanox, uh, PE2Net, SolarFlare, Intel. Intel wrote the technology, so it works on all their NICs, except the 40 gig ones. And uh, what it'll help do is uh, remove the interrupts from the network latency path. And by doing that, we can shave a ton of time off of the round trips. In fact, nearly double the performance on some network cards. This has a lot more impact on um, it turns out to be have a lot more impact on Intel cards than anything else, because I think, uh, let me not speculate. So <clears throat> on certain vendors, you get more of a benefit than others. This happens to be adaptive. So if there's nothing coming through that, that uh, the socket that's on that CPU, you're not actually polling until, until it becomes active, uh, that socket becomes active. So it's actually pretty friendly when it comes to power. A lot of people think that uh, busy polling means you're just going to spin on these CPUs, run them at C state zero the whole time, and, uh, and just burn through your data center's power capacity. So this is a good, happy medium for getting super good latency uh, and not completely melting your servers through the floor. 
Um, <clears throat> this is the type of thing that's enabled in a network latency profile for RHEL 7. And we were, doing, we we're enabling busy poll, TCP fast open, which I don't even think I have a slide on. That's a Google technology. It's in RHEL 7. Um, that can actually cut round trip times for web transfers by a factor of 33%. So by reducing one of the round trips uh, that were required for a TCP handshake. So you mostly see those <clears throat> in web loads. And in fact, as you can imagine, those are the type of things we're looking at for OpenShift, which is um, looking at more of those kind of stateless web apps uh, for the moment. OK, so I briefly alluded to some C states. What we're seeing on the top part of this ch chart is uh, Shaq was saying that RHEL is a, gr a green OS. And it, in reality, it is very, very green because it settles itself into slower clock frequencies and deeper idle states, which means certain portions of the hardware are actually turned off, uh, CPU hardware, or disabled. And um, the, uh, the benefits of that are power savings. However, there's some performance trade-offs uh, certainly in uh, DPD, or in NFV and, and real-time kind of space. <clears throat> but actually, middle-of-the-road workloads for I.O. and network really, really showed this problem. So we had some fixes in the, in the uh, let's say, it's, so, so a year and a half ago at this point, upstream Linux kernel to the CPU idle um, math that, uh, that kind of obviated those really terrible problems that were upstream um, in between RHEL 6 and RHEL 7. They never actually made it into any Red Hat products. So we were lucky enough to find it soon enough, dealt with it <clears throat> with our colleagues from Intel, and solved those issues. The bottom part of this chart shows you if, uh, if you enable the network latency profile, um, the, uh, the amount of time spent in, CP in C state 6 is about 100% when the system's idle. And if you enable uh, network latency, all of that, CP all of that time is spent in C state 1. So that's a much more performance state. And the difference between them <clears throat> is that the amount of time it takes to transition from one state to the other is more or less depending on how deep it is. So for example, on a Sandy Bridge system in C state six, about 100 microseconds to come from six to three. I'm oh, sorry, from six to, uh, to active, so from six to zero. And uh, that's a huge, a huge number. No one who's actually counting microseconds would ever want to deal with that. So we are attempting to move, um, you know, to kind of disable those states and favor performance over power savings. So this is definitely a business decision and uh, you, can, you can absolutely measure it. We've done this sort of thing with OpenShift. You can measure this sort of stuff. Uh, so if it's important to you, it's important to measure. The tool that spits out this data is called TurboStat. Uh, it's in the kernel tools package on RHEL 7 and um, CPU power utils on RHEL 6. By the way, some folks taking pictures. Slides will be available in a couple of days along with the video. Uh, hopefully, they'll have subtitles for my, for my section because I don't know how much is coming across right now. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. So 2x gain, that's 100 buffalo wings. 20x gains, that's 2,000 buffalo wings. So all the chickens in Delaware are nervous because we pay out in wings. But I'll, I will say that as we approach cloud and D NFV and stuff like that, I went logarithmic on my wing chart, so I only pay in quantum you know, dimensions. So you only get 200 wings for the 20X game. So let's move forward to disk I.O. here. Uh, and you laugh, but I do have to buy wings whenever we go out. Um, so if you had, have been using disk I.O. in Linux for a long time, you might have uh, realized there's actually multiple elevators. And so the elevators um, in the past have traditionally started with a completely fair queuing elevator in it had three, four, or I think it was four that introduced all four different variants, um, or NOOP. Uh, NOOP actually does the least amount of merging of, of I.O. and things like that. CFQ actually tried to keep things very fair and even among the, all the disk and all the um, queues that can build up um, for the devices. So uh, unfortunately, that doesn't yield the highest performance. Uh, the deadline scheduler allowed two queues per device. And more and more in Red Hat uh, 5, we would change deadline very frequently if you had enterprise class storage. Red Hat 6, uh, all of our TuneD profiles for performance would, would alter it. And now it's default in Red Hat 7. So the good news is, again, is 7 is much more of a uh, you know, enterprise-ready uh, OS without a huge amount of tuning. Um, 
And so, oops, move forward, oops, forward, not backward. And so it's worth taking a look at these. Um, Jeremy didn't go through uh, in great detail the network, network throughput and latency. There were other things in throughput that we adjust some of the, the send receive sizes and things like that. More and more, the kernel dynamically adjusts those. So uh, very rarely do we see you have to uh, alter the defaults, although 40 gig and now 100 gig networkings, uh, you know, take a peek at what's in our TuneDs. These are all, uh, you know, you can cat these out. They're over in the TuneD, what is it, Etsy, TuneD, where, do, where are all the? Page seven, they're in uh, user lib TuneD. User lib TuneD. So, so again, this is the type of stuff we're doing uh, for disk I.O. And, um, and again, we shared some percentages before. Um, one of the things, I think I did what we call an in-cache set of I.O. zone results. Uh, these get run uh, in our regression systems. There's actually 20 or 30 different mixes that they do. But the other important one I thought on the right-hand side is we have a, a run called out of cache, meaning all the I.O. sizes we're running we're actually not going to be, they're all file system, file sizes that are outside the page cache of the system to, to really see how your, how your disk I.O. is performing at the device level, not just the memory level off to the left. So again, geometric mean of 14,000 data points for each bar graph, run over and over, and we don't release unless, you know, we have to be within, we try to be within 1%, 3%, you know, anything when we get to 3 to 5% we investigate with our teams and we try to understand this across, uh, there's probably, like I said, about at least eight to 10 different uh, metrics, you know, whether you're doing direct IO, whether you're doing um, uh, sync, F-sync, uh, MMAP memory, et cetera. So we're not gonna go through all of those in this, but just to give you an example that we hope are offering uh, good performance, we do, share one application, the SAS um, mixed analytics workloads that SAS uses the Linux page cache very uh, aggressively to uh, extract performance. So their workloads are actually lower is better. So most of my bars are usually higher is better, but as, like Jeremy's latency, lower is better. And I don't know if you can see in the back, we also show system time versus user. And, and so, EXT kind of merged the file system code together. Two, three, and four are actually under a single code base. And we lost a little in EXT three to be able to maintain that in the future. We will, may not get that last 4% back. But instead, we're making sure that the EXT four is essentially almost 5% faster than in Red Hat seven than six. XFS, which is our new default, is 6% faster. And then GFS is actually 9% faster in RHEL 7. And then, of course, our, our file systems, again, we have a, a broad range of both file system size and shapes. XFS is now going into, you know, almost peta, petabyte, not petafile. That's not a good term. The max, the max file size is a half a petabyte. Let me put it that way. And then um, the max single file is 100 terabytes. And so this is where, if you want to, if you're a storage vendor, bring a couple petabytes to uh, room 206 again and share that with the perf team and we'll be happy to find a truck and, and drive that home because that would be a lot of good storage. Uh, bottom line though is we are looking to try to stay scale to this level and we will work with our OEMs to do that. Um, but you know, anyway, so Larry's gonna step you through how the VM deals again with this a complex um, algorithm, essentially, of flushing data to disk now. So um, <clears throat> in the first part of the, the talk, I sort of went over some uh, tunables that you'll see in these profiles. And I talked about the ones that are, that are affected or affect NUMA and the ones that are uh, in and around C groups and all that. And there's a few of them that are global, and they're not either NUMA specific or C group specific. And uh, these, are, uh, these are in and around the page cache and flushing file system caches, 
to disk and, and so forth, and how aggressively the system does that and how aggressively it allows the, the pages to come back in. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is when, when um, these guys run benchmarks, uh, they, don't have to reboot, they don't have to reboot between running one benchmark and, another, and over, over running benchmarks. There's a, there's a really big hammer that we have in the kernel that you probably shouldn't use unless you really want to smash things. And uh, this frees all the memory in the page cache. So what you can do, there's a tunable or a file in Proxys VM called drop caches. And there, it's a, a two-state, there are two bits that, that it obeys, a one and a two. If you echo a one in there, it'll drop all the pages and all the pages in the page cache down to a very low level that are clean and easily reclaimable. So if, if you have, you know, a, 500 gig system and you've read all this data in your page cache and you echo, you have to be root to do it, you echo a one in there, it'll just literally go through the entire page cache and free it. All, with the exception of just a few, a few specific pages, like for instance, libc's text and a few other pages, it won't, it won't get rid of it, it'll get all the rest of them. The same thing with the slab cache. The slab cache is the kernel's repository of, uh, of data structures and it holds on to them as long as it possibly can because it's expensive to go out and get them again. And, and if you, but if you want to restart, your, you want to run a benchmark and you want to restart it just like you were had a fresh boot, but you don't want to go through a boot which can cause a lot of time on large systems, you just simply echo, a, say, a three into Proxys VM drop caches and, and your free list will just jump to almost all of free memory. Uh, once again, that's not a desirable thing to do unless you're benchmarking, but if you are, that's the way you're probably best doing it. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, there's, a, there's a few, a few things, there's a per file system flush daemon that we support in RHEL 6 and 7 now. So what basically what it does is it writes the pages of um, memory uh, back, back to disk and it does this on a per file system basis. On RHEL 5 and, I think it was 5 and before that, it, there was actually a pool of them and you could create and delete pools of them. You could, yeah, PD flush daemon and it could, you could create more of them or fewer of them and it would share in, in a given PD flush set of PD flush daemons could work on a specific device if you wanted. Nowadays it's just one per device and it's optimized for for, to do it as fast as possible. Um, so that in the, this I had talked before in the uh, virtual memory, the, the, the tunables that we didn't talk about yet were the, the VFS cache pressure, the, the dirty ratios in the read ahead. And uh, these are the ones that are not specific to NUMA or the, the containers. Um, as far as the dirty ratio and background ratio, what these are, it, are, these are percentages of memory that must be dirty before the system starts writing them back. So if, you have, if the system uses all of memory that it can possibly get its hands on to cache file system data. And if you, so what this does is you start reading or writing, uh, if you start reading or writing files, it doesn't actually go to disk. It just, we get like two it doesn't actually go to disk. It actually just writes them into the page cache and then counts more and more dirty pages. Once you exceed a threshold, and that threshold is the background ratio, then it starts flicking pages out. If you overwhelm that and create too many dirty pages, then it'll hit the, the dirty ratio. We get two dirty background ratios. Oh, dirty background bytes. Bytes allows you to specify a number of bytes. So the default is 10%. If you lower it, it'll start flushing earlier, so it'll give you better latency, a lower throughput, and the opposite is if you increase it, um, I'm just going fast here because we're running out of time. So here's, the, here's how the dirty ratio and background ratio work. This is 100% of page cache memory. Um, when there is less than 10% by default or the dirty background ratio, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't write any of those pages back to disk at all. Once you exceed this limit, it asynchronously start, via daemons start flushing pages out. And if you overwhelm that subsystem, then what happens is it stops the process and it makes it write, it turns it into a write daemon and it makes it write pages before it uh, will allow any more to be, to be used. And this is like a two-tier um, process. Uh, cool. 
Oh, sorry. So, so I think we've achieved our goal. We have too many slides again. And uh, so we will probably leave most of this last section to you guys to take a peek at. Um, but fundamentally, it's just talking about our cloud products, you know, so you can read the bullets, et cetera. But we have teams working on performance on this. We have some guys working on scale, some other groups. There's other talks on these subjects. Uh, a couple other results in the benchmark world around the SpecVert benchmarks. We're really excited. People are continuing to, partners are using KVM uh, in OpenStack. There's, uh, there's reference architecture papers. There's a, we call them perf briefs when my team does it. And it really starts building up these systems. We're doing like, I would say, small and medium. So we're doing four, four and eight nodes, four storage servers, eight nodes. We got to medium when we're finally doing eight storage servers and um, say 16 or 32 compute nodes. And, and that's kind of Red Hat's performance team not being a hardware group and then we run the workloads in the clouds. And so, similar story, we have different TuneDs, we have different network performance, so we were working on things like building blueprints for jumbo frames, and those in the back row, the top bars, the jumbo frame, uh, and it's including uh, Open vSwitch here, doing, we're not using any hardware offloads, but then we have Mellanox, we have uh, Intel, we have other solar flare vendors that can can further accelerate this with VXLAN offloads. The topologies, these complex tunings that we stepped you through, there's blueprints being made for OpenStack to automate this. And you know, potentially, you won't even see us here next year. Everything's going to be all automated. And we go away as a performance team. Now, I'm confident that software always needs tuning and that we'll still be back because uh, they haven't got rid of us yet. Uh, again, DPDK a little bit some tuning that was involved and per port estimates. So when, when, we get, we, when we're able to release this, you guys can play around with, um, you know, we're open source uh, and or when we, we push our stuff upstream. So we're trying to, you know, keep things a commodity. But the same thing, go to the other talks. I'm gonna finish the deck here with some other talks, both on uh, storage defined and uh, DPDK and networking is, is stored. Software-defined networking and software-defined storage. So here's, again, some scaling, uh, you know, up to 512 VMs, 1,000 VMs in our cloud. And um, we all do, do all the other. The other final plug is that, in fact, Security Enhanced Linux, three years ago, or eight years ago when we first started, we used to kick Security Enhanced Linux to the curb. We got a 10% gain by turning off this. And, you guys all walked out, and I almost got fired. Um, because basically, we need to keep this on. We need to make it work and keep it low overhead. And we've got the lead, some of the development teams. Dan Walsh is famous. SE Linux containers are now doing this. And so we run our workloads uh, with and without this occasionally, but most of the time with it on. And that's where I'll, uh, we'll, we'll just summarize. So I want to thank you all for coming to our session. And again, keep your comments, questions to yourself. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> keep your comments and questions. Bring them to Joe Mario's uh, performance, Birds of the Feather, tonight. So we'll see you then. <laughs>